All right, hey everyone, looks like we are live. Welcome to the stream. Um, we're really happy to welcome Grandmaster uh, Jakob Agard here into uh, the show. This is, of course, Dojo Talks. Um, welcome, Jakob, great, great to have you. Thank you very much. Actually, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what you're, what you're doing with Killer Chess Training just to start us off. Okay, so we have at least one lesson a day, uh, at least one hour. Um, and we have uh, many different types of lessons and, and some of them also at uh, different levels. I would say that, we, you know, if you're 1200, you would find a lot of it quite challenging. Um, but uh, our average subscriber uh, rating is below 2000 though. So it's, uh, you shouldn't be feeling uh, scared because I'm telling you that we have some grandmasters uh, who are members and uh, big, big talents. We have like the Indian junior champion and other strong Indian kids. And we have one of the most promising Russian young players. And we have a, a few, a few national champions. Uh, from various countries like Portugal and uh, I think one or two other countries. Um, but it's uh, uh, well, it's a bunch of, of people I really respect. Invited them as coaches. Um, Sam Shankland, of course, from, from the Bay Area. Um, and uh, at the moment we are uh, have a Ivan Chiparinov guesting us, who is an uh, excellent uh, coach and, uh, and, and narrator. And uh, yeah, of course, he was 2,700 and still very, very strong active player. And Topalov's uh, second in his glory years. We have uh, Motilev from time to time, who is uh, very busy at his main job, which is being head coach of the Russian Federation. Mm. Um, uh uh, Yulena Ismendi uh, from Spain, who's actually he's a US citizen, but uh, speaks perfect English. We have uh, Ivan Salgado, also from Spain. Renia Castellanos, also from Spain. Uh, and Zabino Brunello uh, from Italy. So we have a, a very, very good roster of, uh, of coaches, um, lessons every day. Uh, our our slogan is uh, the best coaches, the best prices, and I think we're okay with with that. Of course, it's a bit presumptuous. Um, the main thing I want to say about it is a really happy place. Uh, it's not uh, it's not my uh, my new idea of fortune and fame. Um, rather, it's something we really enjoy doing. Um, and yeah, we. We have a, both some, some classes that are interactive, like we had Thinking Aloud with you earlier, That's where right. uh, you and I were sharing our rather meager thoughts uh, <laughs> with the audience who were uh, laughing at us in the chat. Um, we have a homework club uh, every week where people can uh, submit their answers and then they get some hints and they can try again. And uh, we gave you a a short membership as thank you for joining us and you should try to submit. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time over the next couple of days just binging as much video <laughs> as I can. <laughs> well, you should give a, a fair review at it at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, so I, I, yeah, the most po the main point I want to make is it's a happy place. We really have a, a nice community. We have uh, uh, tournaments. Um, most Sundays, We tomorrow we're playing a uh, a bullet tournament on Lee Chess. Oh, wow. Um, our tournaments, uh, most of them outsiders can join. Um, so you can just find our uh, Killer Chess Training Rapid and Blitz tournaments. I think the team is called on Lee Chess, and you can just ask to join, and I just click, click approve on everything. We have simuls once a month. Um, so in two weeks, we have three weeks, two or, th two or three weeks. We have with Chiparinov. Mm -hmm. uh, next weekend, we have something we call playing positions. So you can do this in Leeches where you start from a fixed position. So I, I will, it will then be against me and, uh, and you can play it. And then afterwards, we have a lesson where we go through the, uh, the position and 
what people tried and talk about. So yeah, we, we do a lot of things, which is just about getting better at chess. Right. Uh, we do, we don't really rank chess babes and all these things that are very popular or, <laughs> uh, gam gamble and outcome of blitz games and so on. It's, uh, it's more focused on traditional chess values as in what should we play here and how do you find the best move? All right. So let's get into the show. The topic for uh, today's episode is going to be all about tournament preparation uh, and training. Um, uh, Jakob has, of course, worked with a lot of very, very strong players and, and has prepped them for um, high level events. And I mean, tournament preparation is more than just about looking um, at, at openings. Um, so the first question here is, what's the best way to train or prepare for an event that's three or, or more months away? Because actually a lot of people are in this boat where they don't know when uh, over the board chess is coming back. They know they want to get better at chess in the meantime, but you know their next event could be several months away. Or maybe they know what they're going to play in three, four months, but they can literally do anything. You know, what do you think should uh, should they do? I think a lot of guys are going to play from, from the US are going to play in Charlotte in a few weeks as a tournament. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I know a few, few guys who are going anyway. Um, yeah, I think three months out, um, uh, I think focusing on, on, on the, the weaknesses in your, your general play would be my, my main thing. And it, it, it's something you should be doing at all times, I think. Um, for some people that could be openings. Uh, I'm not a, not a big expert in opening, uh, preparation by any means. Um, but openings could be, be the thing. And we are, uh, now more and more in a situation where the big novelties are, are getting rare. Uh, we saw today Carlsen played c4, c6, queen a4 against Sam. Now that's probably not a novelty, but it's also not an attempt to, to prove anything in the opening. Um, so I think mo mostly people should be careful about being sitting targets. Uh, when I done coaching for like national teams and stuff like this, we're very much focused on the element of surprise and mm -hmm. mostly on not being being the victim of the element of surprise. Uh, I had some, some cases with players who were not willing to follow advice and what we had looked at in uh, advance, but wanted to play what they always played and which wasn't even very impressive to start with and saying, oh, that's where I just want to feel comfortable. And then after 10 moves, they, um, they didn't feel, feel very comfortable at the board when the opponent just blitzed that uh, computer preparation. So, um, you want to see if your opponent is, uh, predictable, uh, when you get to the tournament, but before the tournament, I would focus on playing better, especially three months. Um, maybe you need to look at your end games. If you, if you're not on top of your theoretical end games, but in most cases, it's probably just about solving all types of different exercises. Mm -hmm. um, if we're just a few days out from uh, tournaments, then maybe solving very simple exercises together with with fixing openings uh, would be useful. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I've always felt like when when you have a lot of time to work on your chest, that's when you should try to do the stuff that's kind of uh, cuts the deepest, like working on your your calculation, your visualization maybe your strategic understanding of certain middle games. This is the time when you can like, yeah, really like improve your, your skill level to a, a reasonable degree. One or two weeks out, yeah, you can't really change who you are as a chess player. All you can do is kind of try to put yourself into good form and, and maybe review uh, some, some of your uh, likely uh, openings. David, what, what do you think on this? Um, well, I have sort of like a, a question for, for Jakob about something that I often tell people, which is I often tell people to focus on at most two different things in their own game that they want to improve. And I think even with two to three months, that would normally be my advice also be like, you know, maybe one aspect of your opening repertoire and your middle game calculation or 
you know, one type of end game that you're, that you're poor at plus some decision making in the middle game or something like that. I would, because I would have the fear that if you spend three months away from a chess, away from like the situation of your clocks ticking, right. On um, training, you could learn too many things. And when you come to the chess board, you're just kind of confused. Um, so I, I wonder about your feedback on that idea, Jakob. Well, that sounds very interesting. I'll think about that a lot. Uh, going <laughs> forward. Um, yeah, I normally say to people, uh, I also say two things, which is you should focus on, uh, what you're good at and what you're terrible at, mm -hmm. because there is a tendency for some people to be too much like a Russian five-year plan on just only focusing on eliminating weaknesses. Um, a famous analogy is um, that uh, in soccer, uh, European, uh, the European strategy for, for developing players is very much about, you know, making them specialist in some way. While uh, traditionally, I don't know if it's still the case, but the US soccer academies have been more focused on making the players all rounders. And uh, the absence of great American uh, soccer stars, uh, at least in, in the male um, category, is probably an indication that the idea that you can do everything is maybe too much. Yeah. So, so I'm normally thinking if you find something that you're, you're good at, like let's say you're a strong attacking player, you're good in the opening, don't lose your edge. You know, something that's a strength. Make sure it's still a strength. Yeah. Um, and then uh, something that's a, that's a problem for you, maybe now it's the time, three months, you can, uh, you can spend your time uh, really getting on top of the end games or doing calculation training or whatever it is. So um, know, know that Gelfand, when he was preparing for the match with Anand, uh, he sort of threw openings to a side at some point and studied uh, very complex rook end games for two days because he saw an article that really inspired him. Hmm. Uh, so, so even like a top prof professional guy like this is uh, it's also governed very much by by inspiration. Yeah. So I guess the general logic when it comes to trying to find your weaknesses is to like analyze your games and, and look for patterns of mistakes, mistakes that you're kind of making over and over again, uh, or similar kinds of mistakes, whether they're mistakes in calculation or, or positional um, decisions. Do you, do you have anything you do uh, beyond that when you're trying to figure out what is a player's weakness, what exactly they, they should be working on? Uh, yeah, to some extent. Uh, if I work one-on-one -on -one with a student, which which is not very often, I have to say, I work one-on-one -on -one with Sam. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, it's, it's very much exercise based. Of course, we're going to talk about his games and so on. And uh, while we were talking here, he sent me a message saying, "Oh my God, Rook C1! He found it so fast." Yeah. <laughs> when I wasn't responded, he was like, "Oh, whatever." <laughs> disappeared um so yeah i will always as a, as a coach i will always try to look at what are the starting point so let's use sam as an example now sam is you know he's ridiculously underrated at 2691 or whatever it is he'll be back to uh to 2700 plus uh whenever he gets a chance to play chess we saw today that he beat uh, Vidit and Ding Liren, and uh, wow. MBL uh, survived against him, you know. And, um, but we, when I started working with him in, in 20, it was August 2013, I think, there was really a lot of stuff where he wasn't very good. And he was around 2,600. So it's like, he, of course, he was incredibly good. But at the same time, there was a lot of things that he just didn't have covered. Um, so one thing we worked for at least a year with is, I just don't think it's acceptable for someone who wants to be a world-class player, not to find simple forced win at all times. Mm. So this was something I, I sort of uh, had with him. And we worked a lot on that. 
then there was a period where his strategic play wasn't very good and we worked on that and um there are other things we we work on from time to time now we, we to some extent we're in maintenance a lot of the time um but there will constantly be something coming up um which is a technical thing and most of the times i have answers and sometimes i don't because it's a, it's a very high level <laughs> he's playing at <laughs> So when you say maintenance, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, uh, for example, uh, he's probably one of the top five, 10 players in the world for calculation. Uh -huh. Really, really good calculation. And, and then again, we're back to working on strengths. So like, let, we're not going to let that slip. Mm. And uh, th there are many challenges uh, with that. Uh, one of them is to keep concentration while in a pandemic, uh, looking at some positions that are coming via WhatsApp. Uh, so there's, there's definitely also mental challenges. Um, a really important part of having a coach, by the way, and this should not be underestimated, it's very nice to have someone in your corner, someone who wants you to do well. Mm. And uh, if your coach doesn't care how you do, then get a new coach. Mm. And this is a uh, this is sort of the main thing. You have to have someone who cares, and um, and I I, I I know I'm straying here, but um, for me, uh, there are people who are naturally built, emotionally built, to be coaches, and there are people who are naturally built to be players. And it's essentially whether or not you get inspired from uh, the. Uh, success of others or the success of yourself mm -hmm. from all the way from when I started playing chess I was always constantly looking at my friends games and how everyone else was doing and so on and and I could never really sit down and prepare deeply for my own opponents uh, it's in the way that uh, I later have been able to work very very hard for helping others so it's, it's just a natural thing it's not a morality thing because uh, Sam is a little bit the opposite. He's a very, very good trainer. He's very good at explaining things. By the end of the day, he's he's a chess player more than anything. And if chess players didn't exist, uh, there would be no reason for chess coaches to exist. So I'm very happy that there's someone who cares how their games are going. Uh, so, okay, that was straying a bit. No, no, no. Yeah. no. But you still bring up some many interesting points and one thing i want to ask you about really quickly because it's always been something that i've thought about is you mentioned like if your coach doesn't care about how you're doing that's that's not a good coach um obviously you're watching his games as he plays but um how are you emotionally when you watch your students play do you do you get upset do you get worked up do you get worried do you i mean You'd, I'm too, I'm too old cheer. now, but I used to. I used to care, be too much involved. Like, uh, I remember when I was in Moscow and I was watching the playoff with uh, Gelfand and Anand. And, you know, having your, um, your student play for the world championship in a playoff, that, that, that was tough. Mm -hmm. uh, midway through the second playoff game, I went out for sushi. So I didn't watch. <laughs> I couldn't watch and I came yeah. back and he just in time for him to, to ruin this end game, famous uh, rook end game with a H pawn. Yeah. yeah. Cause it seems like you've been around enough top level games that if a game ends in a draw, like you realize that that can happen, you know, or if an advantage slips or there's a move that's hard to find, it seems like the X's and O's of it, you, you understand how it cannot go your student's way. Um, yeah, yeah. Now and then um yeah. yeah i remember uh my first time watching student or students like playing for medals in the last round yeah it's brutal it's brutal if the game is live it's brutal if the game isn't live <laughs> you like you have no idea what's happening uh yeah it's really it's worse tough. when you can't do anything well you always can't do anything <laughs> Well, when when you're playing yourself, you can do something. You know? Oh, right, right. But yeah, yeah. If, uh, if I'm just sitting 
in the booth watching. I had a, a few. If you wanted a few anecdotes for some situations with preparation, I had a, had prepared a few. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, we can we can bring those up um, uh, whenever. Uh, our next question was going to be, what are the most common mistakes players make leading up to a tournament? But if you have some nice stories to tell, yeah, we'd, we'd be happy to hear them. Well, it was... Um... I had some uh, some some scenarios from uh, various uh, students or acquaintances or, or stuff like that uh, from tournaments. Are, are we sharing the board? Uh, yeah, let me bring it up. Okay, there we go. So the the first situation was uh, it's a little bit the general theme here is is sort of in preparation to really understand who you're playing against. So. Um, this was from the Spanish team championship uh, in the very brief period I was working with Ganguly. Essentially, I was helping him uh, understand how to play positional chess. And this is an incredibly smart guy, so it didn't take very long. And, and, and then he moved on to working for some guy called Vichy or something uh, and was, was too busy. Um, but um, but here he, he played a game. and. Uh, Unfortunately, only one of the two is available in, in my database. Uh, he played a game in very early uh, rounds of this Spanish team championship against Krasenkov. And rather than the normal bishop to e2 here, Krasenkov played queen a4. And then uh, Kanguli played b6, which might have even been an alter, and they sort of made a quick draw. Queen c8 was a very nice move for all kinds of ideas, and, and they agreed draw. And then uh, what happened was later in the tournament, uh, the two teams were paired again with the same color. So there was like semi-final, final, I think semi-final. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Surya, he asked me, okay, what's, uh, what do you think I should do? And I checked through um, Krasenkov's game and I found that he had a tendency to repeat things against the same opponent or repeat ideas. Ah. So uh, I told him he's going to play the exact same thing. <laughs> and it's like he's going to be he's going to bluff and think that you you don't you didn't think he's going to play. So here then Surya played this um, very very aggressive way and there was some line and and he played a fantastic game where he sacrificed the exchange uh, after the queen came off and I'm, unfortunately I, I cannot show the game here. Um but this, uh, he, he was very, very impressed. And I was very surprised. And I sort of made the realization that a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people, they, they don't think logically when they prepare. So let me show you another example. So I was talking to my, uh, my good friend, uh, Alexander Mochilev. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me see. So uh, he had a student, and when I say student, I mean more like he's one out of many in the team, called Sergei Kayakin, who won the candidates tournament in 2016. And uh, I, I, I sent him congratulations and things and so on. And I asked him, do you want my view on this? He said, yeah, that, that could be interesting. Why not? You know, and uh, so I, I gave a, a number of, uh, of views, and one of them was, uh, of course, Carlson is a much stronger player. So uh, he's going he's gonna, to uh, press, press, press. And then uh, what Sergei can do is he can just keep it going, because at some point, Carlson is going to expect to win, like, you know, like it's uh, entitlement. Mm. And when he's not winning, then he'll get frustrated. And uh, and in that situation, that's where he can overpress, and then then Sergei has a chance. Mm. And when that happens, hopefully, you know, Sergei can can take the lead in the match. And then it's important that he's ready to 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 play well and defend, and he's going to see a, a different Carlson, uh, someone who doesn't expect to win, but but really is the total cast and we know the monster mm. he will show up and then probably he will lose a game and it will end in a playoff 
And then in the playoff, it is very, very, very important that you have new openings ready and, uh, and you're ready to su surprise Carlson. Uh, and uh, this, this was my lesson from the, the match between Vichy and, and Gelfand in, in 2012, where Gelfand just didn't have anything special for the, for the playoff. I wouldn't say Vichy had either. He had a, a nice novelty that he got to play in the first game. And even though Boris solved the problems, he lost the game uh, mm. because he ran out of time and then made mistakes. Um, and then later, uh, after the, the match, uh, Alexander, he wrote a, an email to me, which at some point was framed and on the wall. Thank you for your advice. You were right about everything. <laughs> I tried to, I tried to uh, explain it to Sergei, but he didn't want to listen. He was too busy giving interviews. And then when we reached the playoff, now it, it was like how he thought that if we reached the playoff, that would be uh, already a great achievement. But then when we reached the playoff, it was like, this was too late. Now nothing to do. And he got killed. Hmm. And one of the other advice I, I gave them was avoid positions with opposite colored bishops because Carlson is very, very strong in them. And this was maybe sent in like May. And then they played one game with each other uh, between them, uh, which was in Bilbao, which is, is this position here. And Carlson was white and without really going into analysis here. He exchanged into opposite color bishops and uh, gave a little masterclass. Mm. And Carson, like Kramnik and Karpov, have a, a great tendency to, um, to go for these kind of positions. And this is a funny, funny uh, little thing that in positions with opposite color bishops, because they're much more difficult, the stronger player, uh, if you look at rating performances, has a huge score. Hmm. Uh, if you, you can look at the Kramnik's preparation for the 2013 candidates tournament, really a lot of it was opposite color bishops idea. Oh, um, interesting. I also think Magnus had another win against, I think it was Karyakin, like in Waikanze or something, like very long opposite color bishop position. It was like equal the whole time, but eventually he, <clears throat> he found a way to, to win it. With uh, queens in an English where he put his queen on h1? I think so. Yeah, it was yeah, it was like a ready ready English type of opening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, maybe I don't remember the game, but yeah. I mean, but that was so years ago. But just to clarify, this was you talking to uh, Modelev, right? Yes. Oh, I see. Who was, who was working with, with Karyakin? Yeah, you he really nailed it. That's ex exactly what happened. <laughs> it was exactly what happened. I thought it was, uh, uh, of course, it would be much better if I could produce the Mutulev uh, email here. That, but OK. Um, so I sort of took this on for, for other situations. Uh, by the way, one of the things I, I did say about the, uh, the match was that, uh, so here, uh, at some point they had this position. This was game 10, I think, that at some point he would have to, you know, really find calculation. And this was the moment uh, in the match where uh, I think uh, Serka, he played like here. Actually, this was a game where White got some, some natural pressure uh, based on a novelty by Sam. So it's just like we were not on the same team here. Uh, Sam, Sam had provided the preparation idea for, for this game. Oh, I see. But here, uh, there was a fantastic combination. If we play King G1, we have Queen G5. And, uh, sorry, just to oh, say oops. here that if, if Queen takes, then check. For some reason, it keeps one, flipping back second, to, yeah. got the wrong board up. Oh, sorry, am I, uh, this, this, this is my usual, uh, I normally uh, apologize for, um, uh, I call it old man and technology. It's a bad mix, it's like <laughs> vodka and milk, which apparently I, I, I do not drink alcohol anymore, but apparently vodka and milk tastes like both vodka and milk at the same time. Yeah. And that's to be avoided unless you're a big fan of vodka and milk, I suppose. Isn't that okay. So this, 
I, I, I used to be married and uh, then uh, uh, when, uh, when we split up, um, I stopped drinking. I realized I didn't need it anymore. Mm. And, uh, okay, so it's, in, in game 10, they, they got this position in some sort of, uh, I'm not sure if it's rule of pass of each Italian, I think it's rule of pass. And Sam had given this idea where he had some, some way for white to put some, some pressure, computer didn't maybe see it, but, but in, you know, in reality, they needed something. And Kayakin, he played knight g5, and he was slowly squeezed and lost. Yeah. And this was the chance where he could have played check. And as I was saying, if king g1, we have queen g5. And then if, if takes, the knight comes out and it's pawn up for black, no, no risks, mm -hmm. at least. And if king g2, that's this beautiful move. Right. Surprise. Surprise. And if king g1, and then queen f6 with the idea queen g5. So if Kayakin had found this, he would have become world champion. So. Yeah. yeah. So I've, this, this, this kind of ideas is, is useful for Mon. So uh, let's go to the, the best story of all for this is uh, this position here. I don't know if you remember this crazy match. Yeah, between, this was uh, uh, Jean, and, right? And this is uh, Giri, it's white against Jeffrey. Right, right, yeah. So um, I've, um, I wouldn't call uh, Jeffrey my student uh, because I don't, I don't work with him regularly. And there's a lot of people who call Jeffrey their student because he does work with a lot of people. Um, some people help him with preparation and some people help him uh, day to day. I know he has a, uh, a private coach in, uh, in Texas where they live, who is, uh, who's, who's a great guy. I should not mention names. It's not my prerogative, but, um, anyway, so, so Jeffrey had been to, at this point, I think just one training camp, one or two training camps in one train camp in, uh, here in Glasgow, uh, back when people were allowed to uh, uh, to be in the same room as other people. Mm -hmm. We had um, uh, training camps with, I think this one here, we had maybe like 11 people. So it was like Sam and Salgado and Jeffrey and... Um, uh, some Mess Anderson, 2600 player, Pragnananda, Cardigan, um, Vaishali, uh, who made a GM norm right after the tournament, uh, right after the camp, uh, and so on. Uh, and one of the things I talked about there was I have this article I've written but never published. It's called What's Wrong with Anish Kiri? <laughs> and uh, okay, so. Um, so this is of course mainly in jest, um, because one of the, the points is not much. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, I should say that I'm, I'm a big fan of any Skiri. Um, Carissa Yip asked me, uh, once is any Skiri your celebrity crush? And I said, I don't know. And I texted my girlfriend and she texted back. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I have I have my little Aniskiri obsession, and I was very um, I was really hoping he would win against Van uh, Van Forest, uh, and sadly he didn't because of the same little problem as always, which is he's not very good when it's time to calculate. Mm. This is what's wrong with Giri. And uh, at the next camp, Jeffrey he he took us through this game as how it was from his experience in the match because. Um, his father, Wayne, uh, wrote to me and said, okay, you, I know you have this article. Do you have any advice? Yes. If you get a position, a worse position against Geary, you will lose. There's, there, it's just, you know, if you get slightly worse position, you will lose. There's nothing to do. On the other hand, he will never checkmate. 
when he has to calculate, he won't do it. Mm. And this sounds ridiculous. And I've said it to other people, like I remember Salgado, he was like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then he uh, was following some of his games and he's like, I can't believe it. How can you be number two in the world and not be able to calculate? And this is actually why he makes so many draws, because if you look at his games, they're very interesting most of the time. He plays all these fascinating ideas. He takes lots of risks. He defends really, really well. Um, but when it's time to kill people, he, uh, he often uh, gets wrong. And uh, this game was famous uh, everywhere on the internet for something that happened a few moves later. But actually, this was the real moment of the game where uh, Jeffrey said that here, Geary spent 12 minutes. This is a rapid, it's a playoff. He spent 12 minutes. He knew he had to find something here. And in the end, he played bishop b2. And uh, yeah. later the game was to one. I, I remember watching this one live. It was very, like, it was very exciting, actually. Because, yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> you could tell he's calculating so much in, in this yeah, position. Yeah, he was calculating. He spent 12 minutes trying to win the game. If he had found the move here, he would have won the game. And it's a one move solution. Mm. It's simply candidate moves. Yeah, I'm trying to remember this one. Um, <laughs> this is like the class we did earlier. <laughs> yeah, I know. So maybe we should let this, let the chat think here. Don't, don't put it on engines, guys. If you cannot resist putting in an engine, at least resist take, telling other people that you have <laughs> seen the move, yeah? Um, but maybe we can go to another topic and people can think meanwhile uh, so they don't have to listen to us and be bored. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, let's let's move on to our, uh, our next question then, um, although we're going to keep it pretty free form, so we might not even get to all the questions we had planned out. But um, what would you say are some of the most common mistakes players make leading up to the tournament? whether it's in their preparation or what they're doing uh, off the board? I think probably the biggest mistake is having some sort of uh, emotional expectation for things to go one way or the other. Hmm. Um, the, the best results come from focusing on moves, on, on, on playing better moves. Um, but it's very common for people to have like, oh, if I don't make an arm in this tournament, you know, then I will quit playing chess and this and that. And we have these strong emotional reactions all over the place. Happens very often. Um, when I did the camp for the U.S. juniors uh, a year and a half ago, uh, there was a, a young young guy who asked the question like, how, what how what do I need to do for enable to be able to quit playing chess? You know, and like, I'm only here because they gave me free hotel and blah 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 and blah blah blah. And, and very recently, I saw he became a grandmaster. You know, so <laughs> these people who are quitting chess, they're always quitting, and I was always quitting. And and it's just not a, you know, just take it easy and play, and and, and don't don't be so emotionally invested in things. Mm. Yeah, I know a lot of strong players, they like quit after every loss. And I certainly have that, <laughs> have that instinct too. Um, so it seems like a lot of strong players, you know, do this thing. But yeah, I definitely feel happier when uh, my next tournament isn't, isn't the end all uh, be all. Actually, I, I learned a lot um, from um, this concept of the growth mindset, which actually I first came across in your book, uh, Thinking Inside the Box. Um, and and that just made like that just made total sense. I mean, I think I was already doing these things somewhat because I realized like if you peg your happiness to your results, then yeah, you'll always just be like a roller coaster just going up and down, uh, and mm. and that's that's just not very enjoyable. Um, whereas if you if you realize that you win as long as you just have like five interesting games in a tournament that you can then learn from, then you kind of win regardless of the actual results uh, in the game. So I'm, I'm totally I, with you. I think, yeah, a lot of people put so much pressure on themselves. There was a period where I played at consistent 2600 rating. I, I started with a quite low rating in this period, so I didn't actually make it to 2600. And then I have kit, then I had kits, and that sort of uh, changed, changed the, 
how everything was uh, was constructed. But there, in that period, I, my main goal for every game was to play something interesting, and then just let it let it be what it what it would be. And I really enjoyed playing chess in that period, and I think that's part of the reason why I played well. Yeah, I think I think this does change or differ a little bit person to person though like for example me if i if i think about results i'll play worse like like you guys are saying yeah. and i'll be much happier if i'm just focused on one particular thing i'm trying to learn or whatever but i've always um felt that sam was actually different than that um compared to me i i he seemed to be somebody who was like you know like if i go to a tournament my goal might be when I get a bad position, defend a little bit better. That would be like my kind of a thing, right? So I go to a tournament and, you know, when I've got a good position, whatever, I'm happy. I play well with a good position. And when I've got a bad position, it's like, oh, here's my chance to work on my goal, you know? And I would just try to focus in on defending better. And Sam would go to tournaments and it would be like, my goal is to, you know, score six out of nine or six and a half out of nine or stuff like that. Like he would really have very results oriented goals often. And it seems like, it suited him on um, better. I mean, certainly better than it would have suited me. Like he had kind of some kind of, you know, sport, sporting kind of uh, approach that, that actually was okay for him. Although I guess, I mean, as far as the happiness thing, he definitely had roller coasters of, of happiness, but it seemed to me like those kind of goals actually worked okay for Sam. Like he could play just for scoring points. Um. Yeah. I yeah I'm I'm not really going to 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 involve myself in psychoanalyzing uh, okay. someone that I actually know uh, in in front of people I don't know, okay. uh, which which is not 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 you guys but uh, uh, in in a private conversation I might say that probably things are more complicated but uh, yeah I I I I have a let's say this way i have a innate belief that uh, whatever you can do with uh, with negative emotions you can uh, do with with positive emotions as well mm -hmm. i don't believe in this idea that somehow you can with negative emotions achieve something that you cannot find a positive way to achieve okay um, so like getting a little bit upset as being motivation you think there's other ways to also the, get the motivated or put in the study people who think that they have to be angry when they lose. Yeah. And uh, for me personally, I, I and, and this is in, in thinking inside the box, and this, I certainly know that these things are different for everyone. Um, but I set this system for myself that, um, that as long as I, I played well uh, or, or tried my best and so on, I was okay with, with, with any result. I, I didn't want to be result driven in that way, um, which, which that really improved things for me. It, it meant that I could lose a game and be okay with it and be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that I mean, I'm like that too to, now. To take risks, and uh, I'm, I'm like that too now in my you know older age than when I was you know you know a very ambitious young player. Um, I, I, I'm very much, you know, if my opponent plays well, I'm happy for my opponent, you know, and, and the game was interesting that that's fine. And I don't think like it's better for the world if I win a game than if my opponent wins a game, but the chat brings up like a pretty famous example, Victor Korchnoi, right. Who mm -hmm. super famous, um, for, you know, basically like, like psyching himself up to hate his opponents. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. he really like, he's got to win and they're not, you know, they're not worthy and that kind of stuff. Um, I've seen him in person and I don't even think that, I, I don't think this is just like a made up, you know, urban legend about him. I think he definitely had at least some elements of that kind of personality that he's famous for. And, and would you be contending that he could have achieved just as much with a sort of love your opponent approach throughout his chess career? Well, you don't have to love your opponent, but, uh, uh, I I don't think that uh, his great intensity would be uh, w was a competitive advantage, but there's there's another aspect of it which is really important, which is when I'm saying that 
uh, you you don't have to be in a, uh, in a certain mind frame. Uh, then it's sort of a little bit about making it a positive thing. So if someone is thinking like, oh, I shouldn't get so upset when I lose, already that's also a negative thing. <laughs> oh, you, you should definitely accept being yourself. Uh, <laughs> so if you know, Kostner, he has this very strong uh, emotional thing when, when he's losing and he just, yeah, whatever, you know. Um, I think it would have suited him sometimes if he uh, if he didn't disturb all the other players that were playing or uh, um, or he maybe apologized once or twice to people he, he scolded. Um, I think that would maybe have, have, su have, have uh, suited him. But on the other hand, uh, I cannot compare my situation with his because I didn't grow up in a war zone looking for dead bodies to eat when I was uh, nine, ten years old. So my perspective is very different. Um, I did meet him and spend an hour with him once waiting for a taxi and talking to him. And previous to that experience, my opinion of him was probably quite negative from what I'd seen him do of dirty tricks and so on. But after that, I was thinking, you know, life is very complex and we should be very careful of, of judging people. And, um, and later on we we actually had a contract with him to write a book called uh, Victor Korsner and the French and he did write one chapter and uh, my colleague Andrew Greet did go and visit him in Switzerland uh, to look at what he had done and he said they were playing some blitz games um, and at some point uh, you know when, when Andrew won a game then it would be like Victor would be like okay export <laughs> you know? so even then he you know, cannot con cannot uh, contain himself yeah yeah so it's it's, it's just it was, unfortunately in the end victor he didn't he didn't want to finish the book and uh, he was he said it's just too old he was almost already close to 80 i think uh, but there was one 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 great thing where he had written a chapter uh, and then Andrew had like checked some things and found some mistakes with computers because Victor didn't use computers, of course. And uh, and there were two notes. So he wrote about Lilienthal, here the chicken-hearted player <laughs> with White agreed to draw. It was a great one. But the other one was, he sent instruction to Andrew, here and everywhere else, please remove the word maybe. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was there was no maybes with Victor. Everything was strong opinions. Here and everywhere else. <laughs> Here and everywhere. We move the word maybe. Um, that's funny. Okay, people are asking for uh, the solution to this. Okay. So in this position here, I said Geary, he thought for like uh, 12 minutes. You can, you can find the game if you go uh, Geary, Shang, Chess24. Mm -hmm. uh, World Cup, and and then he played Bishop B two, uh, after which the position is objectively equal. Uh, after Jeffrey said that after like a minute he realized that if White played Bishop H six, uh, the position is completely winning. Wow. So this is this is a very nice move, of course. So the the key point is that if the rook takes, we are then free to take here because the rook is no longer here to to attack and the pawn is defending here um yeah and so, then so what's maybe the not the... with bishop b2 in this one um okay so the the difference is uh here i, I think if we go here there's a number of ways to play for example here um, and if takes and check and check here oh. and uh, very very soon, White's going to be completely winning. Um, I think there's uh, now here. I'm 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 wondering here. Now you are. I think here, like uh, this, is the simplest winning move. But I'm, I was wondering now if we can play e5. The rook rook takes its own. But I think this is this is the the simplest winning move. 
It does look like e5 just wins as well. It looks it looks like e5 just wins, but but sort of I'm uh, I'm worried there's some uh, some trick uh, somewhere like so let's say uh, here check, and then maybe here there is a clever move like this, and it's not so clear because uh, if white takes the bishop, then there's mm -hmm. a check here. Right, right, and. Uh, and here the king is away and although it's exchange up then the white king is very open and at least there's there's practical difficulties going forward yeah right. yeah definitely but uh but i think theory simply didn't see uh bishop h6 uh so uh here there's there's a lot of interesting lines i'll just show show one here which is quite fun uh, here, 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 and here, and black's okay, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is enough to make your head explode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This okay. Is like... so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I was saying this game was very famous. I'll just quickly show why, because we had all seen it. Okay, here King G8 was best. State played here. So this is the, the very famous position where uh, Gary, he gave a check on g7 and it was later a uh, draw. But when Jeffrey was, was telling the rest of us, uh, we had another camp in like, I think, October, just before the Grand Swiss uh, with six players. Um, when he was telling us about this game, he said, yeah, here he had this uh, win, rook d5 which was like on chess 24 and, and many magazines and so on. They said it, it didn't really matter because we were down to one minute each. We're, there's no no way you're going to play a move like this. Wow. So I, I should probably mention, because now at the moment, a lot of uh, students and, and, and friends of mine, they're playing online tournaments. And maybe the longest I've seen is something like game 75. But, but usually it's like game 60 or even rapid tournaments. There you should um, adjust your openings to being something you can, can actually play. You don't want very difficult positions. And when, what we see in these uh, uh, Carlson tournaments, it's unfortunate that top players see it in the same way and therefore they play the same boring lines in the Italian all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I personally don't don't think it's that great, but I look forward to real chess rather than looking at King F1 against the Berlin. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, the mouse slip. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's bound to happen yes. at some point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let me see, let me close this before people get... To... Nah, I'll just leave it. People can look at the lines if they want. But... Yeah, yeah. So Rook D5 nice was position. winning here? Sorry? So was Rook D5 winning here? Yeah, Rook D5 was winning, but... Okay. But so Gary you got more than one chance. One minute on game. the clock. So the, the line is like this. Oh, right, right, right. I didn't Let's think check on G7 on E7. <laughs> wow. So that's the key point. Um... Nice. Right. Okay, we don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, let me ask you one more question that we had ready. Um, yeah, actually, I think I think people are often wondering about this. What what should be the role of engines when it comes to uh, like your average club tra uh, club player training? Uh, you know, during during this time. Okay, so the most most common uh, mistake I see people do when they they're using engines. It's I think using engines to analyze your own games is a good thing. Um, but you should start by, it's sort of like a three-step process. Uh, first, you should, after the game, you should talk with your opponent about the game. Now, online tournaments, this just isn't happening. Mm -hmm. And even more and more in normal tournaments, people don't, don't bother anymore. When I grew up, everyone did it. You know, like all, all top players would talk to each other. Now they are, you know, you force them in front of a microphone to talk to each other. And mainly they, they don't. Um, 
so uh so so that's sort of the first thing uh you should talk to your opponent about the game and see what they were thinking mm -hmm. um the second thing is to uh uh, if, if you use chess base, which I think most people do, uh, you put into the chess base, you put the game in, and you put in what you were thinking and what your opponent was thinking, and all these things, and you don't turn on the engine. Right. And then in the end, when you have done all this work, then you put you turn on the engine, and it will give you uh, some surprising answers to this and that. And then you try to work out why. Uh, things are in a certain way. Why, why is a, a move like it is? So often this probably turns into sort of a conversation with the engine where it's like, if you say this move is very strong, like rook d5, then what happens with if I do this? What happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? And if you're sort of mentally thinking about it like, okay, I'm going to write a dissertation on this game when it's when it, when when it's uh, when I'm finished analyzing it I'm, I want to know everything that is about this I want to thoroughly understand this game um, then you can get a lot out of working with engines but often what people do they just um, you know they press the space bar a few times and say this was winning and the engine will give the moves which are highest value but not being the the, the critical uh, moves at all and sometimes I see this in, in homework club that also players will will do that. And sometimes you can also see who is uh, cheating right. uh, based <laughs> on this. Uh, I'm sure you, you, you guys have similar experience with some students where you sort of try to gently tell them that, uh, you know, the engine is great, but uh, when you're at the game, you have to think for yourself. So uh, it's, it's good training in doing that. Um, and I, there has been some times when I've told students that, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this thing where you're using the engine uh, to find your solutions to your exercises, it's not a good thing. And I had some, some, some examples of 2100 uh, insisting that, yes, of course, they made 16 out of 16 two weeks in a row to homework where Gelfen made 11 and Sam made 10. <laughs> <laughs> and then they try to explain all the moves why they were the right moves and it's like yeah you're a smart guy you you understand why it's the solution it's just not possible to solve everything and the only actually one one week is called 15 and a half and only and uh the 15 and a half was where the computer gets one uh, move like 0 0.02 higher which doesn't do anything because it doesn't ruin anything either and you can play the idea on the next move uh-huh <laughs> so i gave him half for that but <laughs> no you didn't give him the zero huh <laughs> so... no no there, there was one uh, one who was cheating and, and renier who's also does the homework club we do it together like we take turns mm -hmm. uh doing the friendly or the killer homework uh where he was like what am i to do with this guy who's just sending me computer lines so i'd say just just tell him half of them are wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is like what <laughs> we also have you know yeah I, I see some of this cheating from time to time and, and sometimes i just let it go because sometimes it's just you know that the player tried for many of the positions and then one of them they were like oh you know i'm fed up with this thing and just turned on the engine because they wanted to know and then they couldn't resist writing it down and if it's not a consistent thing then well the training is for their benefit not ours so i don't take it personally because it's not about about us right yeah uh, I mean, but but yeah understanding what's really happening in a way that you can explain it to other people if you do that if the computer can help you do that then you can get a lot out of it um right but if you just press the space bar you get absolutely nothing out of it yeah i mean i think that's why um well i know david is very very anti-engine and, and he would just say like just don't use it at all until you get to a certain level because yeah. yeah we all see it with our students like um and with people in our you know discord and on twitter it's just yeah knowing the evaluation of a position it doesn't really help you for the for the future yeah it's all about understanding like why the best move is what it is and also like how you could have possibly seen this move you know on your own using some kind of like hu human uh thought process 
Um, so yeah, it's like this very dangerous tool. It's like very valuable, but very easily misused. Um, I, I like your point about having a, a conversation with the engine. You really have to be able basically explain, you know, the ideas to someone else and why something is working to kind of fully understand that, it yourself. That's, that's what I do when I analyze. I, I of course, use the engine a lot, um, but I use it very, like I'm, I'm a very skilled user and I, um, I use it a lot also to find exercises that are instructive for students. And just because the, the engine says a move is good doesn't mean it's an instructive uh, exercise. Right. Um, and sometimes uh, there are very impressive things the engine shows that I just don't use because from a perspective of education, I, I have nothing to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, question from the chat, how to use the engine while watching top tournaments i'd probably say very limited right? very easily you uh you you, you turn it off <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh that's it no like for example let's say uh here let's uh let's share again so um uh here i think this is the one yeah uh is this sorry I'm, i i think i need to go there okay there we are so this was uh, Sam's game today. Yeah, let me uh, fix the, the screen real quick, just a sec, so people can yeah. see the whole board. And uh, here, uh, the last move was uh, here. OK, it turns out afterwards that you should play this here. Um, but OK, he played rook a2. And now. Uh, if you're following this game live, then maybe mm. you wanna uh, you wanna ask yourself why did uh, why did he allow Black to take the pawn on d6? Sorry, now, could you just you... Uh, back up a move real quick, just so we can see what happened again? Oh, so it's Ricky okay. too. Got it. Yeah. So here, if he if he if he, if he defends his pawn, uh, then he has this much superior pass pawn, and we would expect him to be better. Right. Um, but on the other hand, he plays rook a2. Now, if he plays rook a7 on the next move, it's probably just completely over. Um, I, I, I could expect it to be, be, be very, very bad. Um, on the other hand, it's clear the white has a plan behind bishop takes d6. Now, let's, let's think we're 1800 and we're watching this. Um, we cannot work out. At 1800, I couldn't work out for sure uh, what's going to happen, but we can always try to, you know, move the pieces ourselves. And because we clicked here, we unclicked computer analysis. Um, we don't know what's happening. So here, let's say we play here and here and here and here and and this looks. Uh, this looks nothing. So maybe we'll try our thing. Like we try, okay, what if I go here? And we might think, oh, that looks very strong until we see that black can go somewhere like here. And uh, here, and, and even if we, white was winning the queen, it's not clear that he would be winning, but, but even if we slow down, we can maybe see this is good for black. Mm -hmm. um, but then if we slow down enough, we might say, okay, looking for other options. Okay, we could take here. And then uh, it will maybe take us a few minutes to work this out. But try to ourselves to try to work out what's happening. And then here, actually, this position was on the board. And this is where uh, Sam was complaining about his opponent <laughs> uh, having seen it in advance. And uh -huh. Very, very fast. And uh, here, MVL, he played this shocking move <laughs> what a killer uh, with the idea that if queen takes here then it's going to be checkmate yeah so for this reason sam played he played here let's go to yeah let's maybe here and now if queen takes then here we could 
maybe be a little cautious, but sorry, no, here the queen has to go to e7 mm -hmm. um, because otherwise rook d8. Mm. So here, here it, could, it could end, uh, the white would have to fight for draw. You will probably still get it, but uh, uh, Sam, he took here and, okay. and the game was drawn later. Um, but following games like this, where you are you are actually trying to guess the moves, uh, I think it's very useful. And then you know after this, you can sort of say, okay, how how was this actually? And then we can turn on the computer and check, and it's like, oh my god, all oh, this was right. And here again, you see the computer variation here, like we have here, like Queen A one. What is Queen A one about? Yeah, there is there's no greater point. This is the only only variation that matters is this one. Right. And this is where, you know, what I was saying with people coming with nonsense moves like G3 here. Right. If their homework <laughs> top, top goes like G3, the computer, A5, G3. Queen A1. <laughs> well, you don't understand anything about the game because of G3. What you understand is that here, Sam thought he was going to win. Right. Because now the, the, the threat is to take there, take on d6, and maybe twice, and then take the queen and winning a piece. But unfortunately, Black had this uh, brilliant move that uh, solves all the problems. And if MVL this didn't is... see this one, then he probably wouldn't have taken on d6. Right. No, uh, here actually, if we turn on notation, you will see that he played uh, uh, rook c1 after 18 seconds. The, the real time was spent here, 138. I think he was partly oh, helped okay. by the fact that what else is he gonna do, you know? <laughs> so it's like, he, he's sort of like, if I can make this work, then great, and he could, and that was it. Uh -huh. And uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there you have it, guys. It's so easy to just, yeah, just think you understand something, but actually get very little info if you just start with the engine. It's much more valuable to have some kind of like human um, human approach to the yeah. you, you saw first. when we were um, uh, when we were uh, having the lesson earlier uh, where you were, were joining us that a lot of the time we, we didn't use engines at all. And then at some point there was one position where uh, you had suggested this rook d1 check. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't understand why it wasn't a good move, and we sort of had to move on. So I, I just checked, and, <laughs> right. and then made something out of it, which was educational rather than just giving information, which wouldn't have made anyone happier. Yeah. Um, okay, real quick, um, maybe we can make this like a one-minute answer for uh, club players. What percentage of time should be spent on? playing versus let's say studying versus actually like solving exercises um so playing if you can play tournaments and you're a club player that would be great uh, make sure you analyze your games and you learn something from your games uh otherwise it's sort of a wasted chance you spend hours uh, mentally involved in something and then you don't get something you don't you don't get any feedback out of it or uh, th that's that's a huge waste. Um, I think that definitely chess is a very practical game. It's a decision-making game. Uh, so you can also become in a situation where you're very good at solving, but there's so many positions in chess which are not to be solved, but are to be played and, and, and making choices. Most, most moves we make during a game is not why to play and be better or why to play and not lose or anything like that. It's more like here there's a number of different moves and how can we can we continue from here? And, and certainly uh, that's a very important aspect. For me, playing was always really a part of improvement, mm -hmm. uh, integral part. Um, I think when it comes to things like blitz, uh, then uh, I don't know. David is a little bit of a purist, so maybe you are against online blitz as well. I, I don't know. Um, it has its uses. It has. Its I, I think it, the main use it has is that it's fun. Yeah. And uh, it's the same thing as watching games online. I, I think the main thing with it is fun and inspirational. I don't think it's a way to get better at chess, really. 
Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, we hopefully we we we, we play chess because we like it. Yeah. And, and I, think I mean, like one application I have of Blitz is if there's some particular position that you want to get better at, you can sort of like get in more games with that position, whether it be an opening or an end game. I use it for end game training, like, you know, playing five or 10 minute games again and again from an end game position. And similarly, if there's a new opening you're learning, sometimes you can get in 20 or 30 games with a friend playing that new opening. I actually think uh, playing, let's say, uh, on, on, on lead chess or something like this, where, uh, you know, you can go in and, and, and download your games. So if you play for, for a little bit and you try to play these new openings, you will very quickly find out where your, uh, uh, your blind spots are. Right. Mm -hmm. I think there you can get a lot out of it. Um, the one with the end game playing, playing blitz games and end games, it's like, maybe practice and winning with bishop and knight against king or other theoretical positions could be very interesting otherwise i don't know but you know many people do things in many different ways where yeah. okay cool well i think we'll um wrap it up here thanks so much uh Jakob, for a great talk um once again guys um, right now you can uh, get live training throughout the year um, from uh, Grandmaster Jakob Agard and, and many other Grandmaster coaches on KillerChessTraining.com. Let me put the follow command in the chat. And um, yeah, thanks so much for, for joining us. If, if you missed any part of it, the whole thing will be up uh, on YouTube. I'm sure we'll be sharing that um, soon. And uh, thanks to everyone who, who tuned in. Uh, it was awesome to have a really, really engaging chat. Yeah. We, we probably owe him a quick reminder to everybody that he's offering a special promotion one week tryout of the Killer Chess training uh, training website, lessons, homework, um, and giving that at a, at a very I think on our YouTube 19. channel, we also have one or two lessons that we just put up. Uh, so. Yeah. So if you're interested in trying that out, um, you can do so for one week at a at a pretty cheap rate, nineteen dollars or euros. euros. I don't know which it was. Euros Probably is euros what, is what you're using now. Yeah. So you can give that a, a, a test, and if you even do one class, it'll have been worth it for you probably. But you'll find out if you know if the level's good for you and and all that. So. Yeah, and, and just when when people join with this offer, just be aware that the website is set up in a way that then after a week, it will it will it will take the remaining five hundred and eighty euros automatically for you to to make it a year membership. So if you want to avoid that, then you can cancel that immediately, and you can always you know join again. Uh, but uh, but that's that's how it's set up. And of course, uh, um, I, I I do want to say one thing. So we also have a, a monthly membership, which is I think 149 euros or something like this. Um, mm -hmm. That 70% of people who take a month membership actually make it into a yearly membership. Um, so it's uh, so people are generally happy with our site. It's a happy place. It's the main thing I want to say. Cool. Um, and is the is the trial is that just available on their site or on your site or do yeah, they need some code? Yeah, you just go into the site and uh, great. Uh, I think there will be a shop or something. I'm I'm not very technical. <laughs> all good. Um, all right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much, Jakob, for for joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you all uh, next time. Have a good have a good rest of your weekend, y'all. Thank you.